Right. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Dr. Cardicarius. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in Applied Mathematics at uh, Brown University in 2015, working under the supervision of Dr. Ka Kanyardakis. And prior to joining uh, UPAN in 2018, um, Harris was a postdoctoral researcher at uh, mechanical uh, department, mechanical engineering department at MIT, working on physics-informed machine learning and design optimization under uncertainty. His work spans a wide range of areas, um, including the computational uh, science and engineering with a particular focus on the analysis and design of complex physical and biological systems. You will see some of those in today's talk, I'm sure. And uh, finally, he is a recipient of a uh, very prestigious um, career awards from DOE and Air Force. And so uh, we are expecting great talk today. Uh, with no further ado, uh, here we go. Uh, Dr. Park, Padiakis, it's all yours. Uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jiang Xu, for the nice introduction and also for having me here today with you. I'm, I'm excited to, to connect with you and present some recent work. Um, so uh, to the audience, as Jiang Xu just said, please use the chat. I'll try to check that sporadically, but also feel free to uh, unmute your microphones and interrupt me uh, if you have any questions at any point. Today's talk will be more uh, focused on methods, and uh, I'd like to discuss some recent work we've done in, this, in the context of what we call physics-informed neural networks, which essentially is a class of methods, um, a class of deep learning methods that we're trying to apply for simulating physical systems uh, involving partial differential equations, both for forward simulations, but also for solving inverse problems. Um, today will not be much focused on success stories, but more on open challenges, open questions that we're trying to understand and address uh, to, to get a better understanding of how these constrained deep learning models behave uh, when we're trying to train them and, and fit them to a particular problem. So let me start with some motivation, and everything that I will share today falls under this umbrella of how do we use machine learning for physics for uh, simulating or studying physical systems, or vice versa, how do we use physics to sort of inform our learning algorithm? And let me start by an example that um, that was a very recent DARPA project uh, that ended um, a few months ago. Uh, so there was a DARPA program called the Physics of AI, um, and essentially there were two different schools of thought that emerged out of this program. The, the main idea here is how do we bake in physical laws into machine learning pipelines or machine learning algorithms. And there's two uh, schools of thought here, basically. So one is that we want to basically design architectures uh, from the bottom up. So uh, carefully sit down and design specialized architectures that have very strong inductive biases in the sense that they implicitly satisfy the principles uh, we want to, to encode in them. So for instance, they can, uh, uh, implicitly be invariant to simple group symmetries of the underlying system. So a great example, as you all know, uh, that falls under this category is convolutional neural networks that are designed to uh, respect certain symmetries that are um, uh, focused on natural images. Uh, but there's other works, uh, for instance, I'm showing here a figure from a worker of Vici Condor who has spent a lot of time thinking how to encode certain um, invariance properties uh, like invariance to permutations and rotations for st uh, studying many body and molecular systems. So the goal there is basically to, to train neural networks to predict uh, properties of a molecule given the uh, configuration of, it, of its atoms. And obviously, the, you know, the property should not change if you rotate the molecule in a certain way or, or um, uh, it should remain invariant under certain permutations. So the great thing about the first school of thought is that the physics can be implicitly encoded and it's implicitly satisfied uh, by the network with no approximation. However, you really have to design those models from the ground up. That means you cannot really borrow 
you know, fire up your TensorFlow or PyTorch library and then borrow existing building blocks. You have to really take a step back and code those architectures. Maybe you have to write your own CUDA kernels for scaling them to GPUs and so forth. So uh, that, that is the price you need to pay. Now, the second school of thought, and this is where this talk will be more focused on, is kind of like the easy way out in the sense that we are working with conventional network architectures. So we'll be using neural networks to represent the solution to our differential equations, um, typically fully connected or convolutional networks. So we will have fairly weak inductive biases. And then we'll try to encode the physics during the training of the network using some certain penalty functions or regularizers in, in our training objective. Okay, so uh, this is not a really new idea. So the first people who try to uh, take that route in the context of using neural nets for solving differential equations uh, goes back to the early 90s. So the work of Sikoyos and Anger and then Lagaris in 98. Uh, and then this whole uh, idea was recently revived a few years ago and uh, has sparked great interest. A lot of people are working on this area as we speak. Uh, basically, what was the game changer is that instead of um, using you know, manual derivations to complete derivatives of neural networks, we now use automatic differentiation pipelines. So let me just give you a little bit more detail. So what uh, I mean here and essentially introduce to you what uh, we call as physics-informed neural networks. So basically the idea is that we have a physical system that we want to study and that system is governed typically by um, a partial differential equation that has uh, space and time variables. And now the goal is either to solve that PDE if somebody gives us the precise equation or the, that would be the forward problem or the inverse problem means that we have a collection of observations we may or may not fully know the PDE, and we want to use those observations to calibrate uh, any unknown terms, so essentially to, to calibrate parameters or discover missing terms or closures and so forth. So that would be the inverse problem. But in both settings can be addressed under the same framework in which we will actually employ a neural network to um, represent the unknown uh, dependent variables of the problem, which are here denoted by U. So, for instance, you know, if you're studying fluids, that would be um, uh, the velocity field and the pressure of your fluid system, right? Uh, so, we're trying to model the solution of the system using a neural network. And basically, uh, we realize that this is a differentiable representation. So, this is very similar to what people have been doing a long time in numerical analysis, where you're choosing a representation of your unknown solution, uh, typically as a linear combination of polynomials or some other basis. Well, here we're using a neural net, uh, which essentially you could think of it as, a, as an adaptive basis uh, model. So in a fully connected neural net setting, you have the inputs X and T, there, you push them through the network, and then whatever is at the last hidden layer of your network uh, can be combined in a linear combination to give you the output U, and essentially that would be the adaptive basis in which you represent the solution. So now, as I just mentioned, this is a differentiable representation, meaning that we can take derivatives of the output of the neural net with respect to the inputs uh, here denoted as X and T uh, that stand for space-time variables. That means that we can compute uh, operators that form the residual of our PDE or operators that form the boundary conditions of our PDE. So essentially, by doing so, we can formulate now a composite loss function and essentially define if you wish, a multitask learning problem in which we're trying to train the neural network to achieve different objectives at the same time. So the first objective is to fit any available data. So we're penalizing the data fit. The second objective is to try to minimize the residual of our PDE. So we're trying to encourage the outputs of our neural net to approximately satisfy the differential equation that we know. And finally, we're also trying to match any available boundary or initial conditions. Um, all at the same time. So again, this dates back to the 90s and the, the catch back then, and that's why I think this type of frameworks did not really take off, uh, was that people had to really sit down and manually derive those gradient computations. Um, so you write down the forward pass of your neural net on a piece of paper and then you try to take derivatives. And you can see that for more complex equations that require complex derivative, you know, differentiation operations, or complex neural net architectures, this, this can quickly become a really, really tedious um, uh, task. Uh, 
So essentially what happened um, a few years ago when we started this line of work is that we started using automatic differentiation. Uh, so essentially we realized that this whole computation defines a computational graph, and then we can basically use a chain rule um, with automatic differentiation libraries to compute all those gradients of the output with respect to space or time coordinates, but also the gradients, of course, as usual, uh, with respect to the parameters of the loss function so that we calibrate the weights and the biases of the model using gradient descent. So this is a general workflow for this type of framework of physics and form neural networks. We start from some given PDE for maybe which we know up to some um, missing terms or parameters, and we proceed by approximating the solution using a deep neural network, and that essentially defines a residual. So we can differentiate now this, we can plug in the neural network in the PDE, uh, compute the necessary derivatives, and that will give us a, a residual, which I denote here by R of uh, X and T, that also shares, you can think of it as an, a neural network that shares the same exact parameters as U of, or F of theta, uh, that represents a solution, that now evaluates the, the residual of your PDE. And now based on that, we can construct this composite loss function that has the several terms that I just mentioned for penalizing data fit if we have observational data, minimize the PD residual, and fit any initial or boundary conditions. And now this composite loss function will be then minimized using, typically will be minimized using some gradient descent um, algorithm or stochastic gradient descent, uh, for which here all the gradients will be computed with automatic differentiation. So the, both of the gradients with respect to the inputs of the neural net, namely space and time coordinates, but also the gradients with respect to the weights and the biases of the neural network. So that defines a very, very simple workflow. And, and to convince you, let me just give you a, a toy example to see that you can actually solve PDEs in you know, 10 lines of Python code, basically. So here's a 1D Burgers equation. It's a toy problem um, in fluid mechanics. Uh, that, uh, a poor man's model for studying turbulence. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a nonlinear hyperbolic PDE. Here it's defined in one space dimension with some appropriate um, uh, initial and boundary conditions. And then basically all it takes is that we have to define the neural net, the, the solution as a neural net, as you see here. Uh, I'm here I'm using some TensorFlow uh, semantics. And then based on that, we can compute the residual simply by taking the gradients of the, um, the appropriate terms to form the PDE residual, uh, again, using some uh, automatic differentiation and TensorFlow. I see a question here. So how many passes do you need to backpropagate to get the second derivatives? Uh, essentially, let me go back here to answer that question. Uh, to get second derivatives, essentially, you just need to construct larger computational graphs. So you, you, you can compute du dx, for instance, and that defines um, uh, a computational graph that is probably twice the size of the graph that just evaluates the neural network. And yes, the, the, every time you need to, to take a derivative, uh, second order derivative or third order derivative, this computational graph will keep increasing. So that is one of the potential computational bottlenecks that high order systems with high order derivatives uh, cause this exponential blow up in the computational graph um, and the memory required for uh, performing automatic differentiation. However, this is assuming that you're using standard automatic differentiation approaches. So there's other um, more technical approaches to automatic differentiation that are based on Taylor expansions that are trying to bring down the footprint of taking high order derivatives. But um, that's sort of like a subtle uh, topic that I'm not gonna get into uh, details today. Okay, so going back to the Berger's equation, essentially a few lines of Python code can um, define the loss function for this problem, and then we can evaluate it and minimize it uh, using gradient descent. And at the end of the day, what happens, uh, we can get the prediction. So basically what you see here at the top plot uh, is the predicted solution for this problem. So the horizontal axis is time coordinates, uh, vertical axis is the spatial coordinate. And then the black axis are, are the data that you observed. And here in this case, the only data that you observed were data for the initial condition and the boundary condition of, of, of the problem. And you see that they are all scattered in space time. So obviously, if you were to train a plain neural network using this data, you wouldn't be able to really extrapolate away from them and produce predictions inside the domain, right? So that would that would be you asking too much from your neural network, you're asking to extrapolate far from the data that gets seen, and it would fail. However, now that we bring in this physics-informed regularizer, if you wish, 
This is essentially what enables us to get the uh, predicted solution inside the domain. As you see here, um, in the middle part, these are just some slices, temporal slices, and you can, we can compare the predicted solution versus the exact solution, which is analytically available for this problem, and you see a very good agreement. Um, this is, shouldn't be too impressive for anyone. However, I should point out that this is a deceptively simple problem uh, in the sense that if you were trying to solve the same problem using a classical numerical method, you'd have to be very, very careful about how you discretize your, your domain in order to capture accurately uh, the steep gradients that the solution develops around uh, x equals zero. So at finite time, the you know, you're starting from a smooth initial condition, but um, uh, due to the small value of the viscosity here, this new variable in the uh, Berger's equation, which is taken to be 0 0.01 over pi, at finite time, your solution will develop these very steep gradients. So, um, however, for the neural network, this is not, uh, not a problem. Uh, it has the capacity of approximating this kind of irregular function, if you wish. And, you know, the training for this simple problem takes very, very little time, a few seconds on a GPU and some reasonable prediction error. So this is just a toy introductory example. This is by no means the most impressive result uh, that one can get. Uh, so indeed, I see a question here. We're doing the viscous problem. Um, the shock problem will blow out the derivative computation. Uh, in fact, we can solve the inviscid Berger's equation as well, but with some small modifications in the method. But yeah, so this is a viscous Berger's equation with a very small viscosity. But in, in fact, you can actually tackle the inviscid problem as well using uh, these techniques. Uh, so let me just move forward now to uh, a more uh, impressive case study. Uh, actually, that was not performed by my group, but uh, this uh, goes back to my advisor's group at Brown. That was a paper that they recently published in Science. Uh, okay, let me go back. So hopefully you can see the animation now. Uh, essentially, this showcases the ability of, of this physics and form neuralness to also operate in the inverse problem setting, uh, which is also very interesting. So in this case, uh, the task that they wanted to uh, solve is the following. So what you see here, the animation in the top left, this is just a movie of some pa passive scalar quantity that's advected uh, through the bloodstream uh, in someone's uh, artery. So what you see there is a cerebral aneurysm, so it's just an artery that has this abnormality in the arterial wall. And basically, there, um, there's blood flow, but we don't really know what the actual flow um, field is. But what we have is some measurements of this passive scalar quantity. So in panel B there, you see the aneurysm sac, and the measurements correspond to some special temporal um, uh, data points that we have collected along those slices inside the aneurysm sac. So you see two, two slices. Uh, these are the, the locations where the data points for the concentration variable are collected. Now, the question is, if somebody gives you this special temporal data of the concentration of the passive scalar, can you infer what is the underlying velocity field and what is the pressure? So, by the way, there is no information here about geometry or boundary conditions. The only data is the measurements of concentration along those two slices. So, the exact location of the arterial wall is not known. So there's no boundary conditions that are supplied. And the way this, um, you know, the folks at Brown were able to solve this problem is by employing a physics informed neural network that takes as input the space and time coordinates for this three-dimensional problem, and then outputs um, five quantities of interest, namely the concentration variable, the velocity components, U, V, and W, and the pressure. However, the velocity and the pressure here are latent variables. They are not observed. No measurements were available. However, all of them, uh, the namely the concentration, the velocity variables, and the pressure, are all correlated to the underlying physics. And physics is expressed um, in the form of the Navier-Stokes equations for the incompressible fluid, coupled with the advection equation for the passive scalar. So these are the equations you see at the uh, top right of the slide. And essentially now, these are the equations that can help us formulate uh, the PBE residual, which will give us this physics regularizer in the loss function of training um, our neural net. So now if we train a neural network in order to fit the concentration measurements and at the same time minimize the residual for this PBE system, um, if we succeed in doing so, then we will, should be able to predict the underlying latent variables uh, for the velocity and the pressure, 
uh, and this is what you see here in the B panel and the animation, you can see that indeed uh, the, um, the authors were able to predict accurately uh, the underlying velocity and pressure field, and also reconstruct you know, streamlines overflow and so forth. Uh, so that was sort of an impressive application of this framework uh, that was published recently on science. However, I should mention that everything here, there's a little catch because everything here was uh, done and the model was trained on synthetic CFD data, uh, which means that these data are relatively clean. They're not contaminated by uh, noise or error, model error. Uh, uh, it's a little bit more challenging to, to employ those methods in realistic uh, let's say PIV or 4D flow MRI or realistic experimental data that is more heavily corrupted by noise. Uh, anyways, so I think this is all I have in terms of success stories. As I said, today's talk will be more focused on the methods and trying to understand the training dynamics and the you know, uh, limitations or open questions related to these physics informed neural networks. So let me just take a step back and, uh, and give you an overview of uh, what we're doing here again. Essentially, we're considering physics to be as a prior for our deep learning model, and we're defining these composite loss functions. So we're trying to inject the physics during training of the model using regularization. And the regularization here is not really common, right, in the sense that typically uh, people, when trying in neural nets, you may uh, regularize the magnitude of the weights of those parameter data. So you may you know, consider the L1 or the L2 norm of the weights, However, here we're trying to regularize the output of, of your neural net, which is sort of a functional constraint. So it's, a, it's a, so some sort of unconventional regularizer in the context of machine learning models. Um, and despite the success stories that I just showed you, failure can happen at any time, even for the simplest problems. So here's just a toy example again. This is a Helmholtz equation defined in a two-dimensional domain, a simple, elliptic, linear equation, nothing uh, complicated here. However, if you choose to represent the solution of this equation with a physics informed neural network and you train it uh, using the framework I just presented, you, it won't be easy to obtain accurate results. So here's just an illustrative example where um, a fully connected network with four uh, hidden layers gets about 20% uh, relative error in, measured in the L2 norm. So as you see here, there's a lot of error coming from the boundaries of the, of the domain. That means that the neural net has a, a lot of trouble fitting the boundary conditions for this problem. Um, now the question is, why does that happen? Well, uh, where does this, uh, those issues originate and how can we fix them? Um, question here, is the regularization still necessary if we have enough data? Um, well, it depends on the problem you're looking at, but if you want to extrapolate away from your data, then yes, you need to have the regularization such that, you know, your extrapolations will be consistent with the physics and you can get ac accurate extrapolation. Or in the context of inverse problems, you need to have, uh, uh, you want to infer unknown parameters in that setting, you also need data. Okay, so going back now to the question here, what's going wrong, let me just mention again, uh, what I just said, that essentially the way we introduce physics is, this, is by means of this unconventional regularizer, um, which in many times requires us to revisit um, standard practices. So here, for instance, you know, we can choose to use the mean squared error as a loss function, or we can use, uh, use a, a fully connected network as an architecture. Um, maybe we normalize our data or not. Maybe we use gradient descent or Adam as an optimizer. So all those bullet points most of the time people are taking take them for granted and we make choices we just say oh, okay adam, the adam optimizer works great for deep learning let me just throw uh, it in my problem however what i'm arguing here is that for these type of problems we need to revisit these standard practices and, and ask ourselves whether they're appropriate or not um, so as a general statement here is that despite some empirical success of these methods we're, we're really still lacking a rigorous understanding of when and why these physics constraints can be effective in regularizing deep learning models. So sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work and we really try to understand when and why uh, they don't work. So this is really the focus of, of the work that I will present today. And it all started uh, a few months ago where actually looking at this exact same benchmark that I'm showing, we try to do some post-processing to really understand what's going wrong with the training dynamics of this neural network model. Uh, 
And essentially, this is just um, an overview of the symptoms that we observe. And I think it's kind of educational and informative to think of uh, the gradient descent problem in continuous time. So essentially, what you see there at the top is the gradient flow system for, for our physics informed neural network. Essentially, when we're training our model, uh, we are basically simulating this gradient flow from some initial condition to a local minimum that corresponds to some local equilibrium of this ODE system. Uh, theta here are the parameters of your neural network. So essentially, this is the equation that governs the evolution of the network parameters uh, during training uh, by a gradient descent. And essentially, gradient descent, uh, all it does, uh, it, it just corresponds to a forward Euler discretization of this gradient flow problem. Okay, so, so what is going on with those constraint objectives that we're working with? Well, it, it, it turns out that when the solution, the underlying solution to the PD is complicated, so it may exhibit high frequencies, um, like in the example that I just showed you uh, back here. So you see here we have a solution with uh, an isotropy and more frequencies in the X2 direction than in the X1 direction, um, or you have a solution with multi-scale features, well, it turns out that this gradient flow problem becomes very stiff. So in this control setting, you see this plot on the right for different choices of some constants in RPDE, we can actually show that um, the stiffness of the gradient flow is increased. Um, the way we measure stiffness here is by looking at the largest eigenvalue of the Hessian of our neural network. So that sort of gives us an indication of the stiffness of the problem. And then if you go back to numerical analysis and ask yourself what happens when you're discretizing a stiff ODE with forward Euler, well, that imposes a very severe restriction on the step size you can take. And here that choice uh, means that we need to choose a really, really, really small learning rate. And the answer is indeed, if you do choose a small learning rate, you will be able to solve the problem that I just showed you. Uh, and now, however, you need to choose a learning rate in the order of 10 to the negative 6. That means you may have to wait for a few days to solve this toy linear uh, elliptic equation. So that is not a practical solution. So indeed, the hypothesis is that stiffness exists in the gradient flow dynamics of physics-informed neural networks. And now the, um, what that does is that uh, consequently, this stiffness leads to imbalanced gradients during backpropagation. So what you see there in the plot in the bottom right, if you now post-process and kind of try to analyze the training of your model, and you can try to visualize the gradient magnitudes or the gradient distrib the distribution of the gradients uh, during backpropagation um, for the two different terms in the loss function. So in this case, we had a term that is trying to fit the boundary conditions for the problem, which is denoted here by LUB, and a term that is trying to minimize the residual. You see here that the gradients corresponding to the boundary loss all collapse around zero. So that means that during training, during gradient descent, the network cannot really change the parameters, um, its parameters in order to fit the boundary condition. And consequently, it has a lot of trouble fitting the boundary condition. And for the simple elliptic problem, if you don't fit the boundary condition, you cannot hope to get an accurate solution. But again, this is just a symptom of the pathology. This is just the post-processing of inspecting, uh, you know, the patient died, and now we're kind of post-mortem, we're, we're saying, oh, trying to, to, to understand why the patient died. Uh, so now the question is, what is the actual disease, right? Can we make diagnosis and, and, and can we work on finding a cure to these problems? Um, so the focus of this work uh, that I will present today is really on trying to step, take a step back and try to analyze and understand the training dynamics of these constrained physics-informed neural networks. Um, so to do so, we actually, uh, let me introduce some key concepts that we use. First of all, we try to come up with a practical theory for understanding uh, physics-informed neural networks. And to do so, we, we will explore a connection between deep neural networks and kernel regression methods. Um, in fact, it, a well-known result is that a neural network um, with one hidden layer that is infinitely wide, so at the, at the uh, in limit of infinitely many neurons, uh, that neural network converges to a, a Gaussian process with a certain kernel, and the same thing holds for deep neural networks. So at the limit of infinite width, we know that neural networks converge to a Gaussian process with a certain kernel. So that will, from the theory standpoint, that will help us analyze a few of the properties. 
However, what is more interesting is that the evolution of an infinite width network during gradient descent, so under the gradient flow dynamics, can also be described by another kernel, which is called the neural tangent kernel. Okay, so this is uh, one of the main tools that we will be using here to analyze the performance. So again, the, the idea is to understand how the neural network parameters evolve and the outputs of the neural network evolve during gradient descent, and we will do so through the lens of this NTK kernel. Okay, so let me just uh, start by uh, some preliminary theoretical results that uh, one can deduce from this analytical framework. So the first result is we can actually show that, uh, which kind of confirms our intuition that physics and form neural networks converge to Gaussian processes at the infinite width limit uh, for linear PDEs. And to see that, we, you know, you can start from a toy problem like the 1D Poisson's equation in which you can actually write down your neural net representation and you can take derivatives of this analytically to compute uh, the second derivative that you see there, UXX. And basically we prove the following theorem, that assuming that the activation function is smooth and it has a bounded second derivative, which is the standard practice for most deep learning activation functions, then a fully connected neural network with one hidden layer at initialization, if you take the limit of infinite width, that converges in distribution to a Gaussian process um, for both the function itself and the second derivative. And that Gaussian process has a certain kernel which you can derive analytically. And now this kernel, you see, depends on the second derivatives of your activation function and so forth. So this is sort of just a consistency result. We knew that this result holds for plain neural networks, and now we show that it also holds for physics-informed neural networks under linear PDE operators. It's not a practical result, uh, so you, you can't really deduce anything about the trainability of the network from this result. Uh, however, by induction, you can generalize it to deep fully connected architectures and any linear PDE operator and in some sense opens up the path for um, performing some approximation theory studies to, to quantify the accuracy convergence rate uh, by looking at the limiting kernel that is introduced. So essentially at the infinite width limit, um, we converse to a kernel method and that induces a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So now we can check whether the solution of RPD lives in that space and then try to come up with certain um, theoretical convergence uh, rates uh, uh, guarantees. Okay, so again, let me just remind if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me, but for me, I think that the more interesting part is the next part where we're actually trying to study how um, the network parameters and the network outputs evolve under gradient descent. So what happens, well, you know, try to understand the training dynamics. So to do so, we, we can start from the gradient flow. So this is essentially what I showed you earlier. And here L is the total loss, which includes the summation of the boundary losses and the residual losses and so forth. Um, so it turns out that starting from this gradient flow, you can derive the, the closed form system for the evolution of the outputs of your neural network, uh, denoted by U, and also for the residual of your PDE. And um, the outputs and the residuals define an ODE system that is governed by the equation you see at the top, uh, where you see the data playing a role on the right-hand side. This is the, the network evaluated at the boundary points minus the correct boundary points, and then the residual evaluated at locations XR, which are the uh, points inside of the domain where we're trying to penalize the residual, minus the values for the residual. And then you see a linear operator here denoted by those four blocks, KUU, KUR, KRU, and KRR. Essentially, this is what, what we refer to as the neural tangent kernel. Okay, so this is a matrix that is a, a function of time. And the individual blocks essentially are, are um, the, correspond to the Jacobian of your neural network outputs with respect to the parameters of the neural network. So DU, D theta and the L D theta for the residual. So you have four different blocks. You have the boundary term, which is KUU. You have the interaction of the boundary term and the residual, which is KUR. And then you have the residual term, term KRR. Uh, and that defines uh, a symmetric uh, 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 matrix here. So now the question is, can we understand, can we analyze this matrix, this uh, neural tangent operator, and 
through this analysis, shed some light and understand uh, the training dynamics of our uh, physics-informed neural network model. So uh, the first thing that we did, and it's a quite interesting result, is that one can show that the evolution of the neural tangent kernel um, remains almost constant during gradient descent. And, and you can see that, again, by starting from a toy problem, again, this one de Poisson equation, you can write down this closed form system that governs the evolution of your neural net and the residual in terms of the NTK. And th we can actually prove the following theorem. So for a physics informed neural network, again, with one hidden layer at initialization and at the limit of infinite width, uh, we can show that the NTK of this physics informed neural network model converges in probability to a deterministic limiting kernel that we denote here as K star. Uh, more interestingly, um, for any positive time, we can show that this kernel stays almost constant uh, during training via gradient descent. So this kernel does not really change. So you, you compute it at initialization, and that can give you a lot of information about your training um, uh, by, by examining the, spect the spectral properties of this NTK kernel. And on the right-hand side, you just have, see some numerical um, verification of this theorem. You see that as a network width is increased, we are reporting um, basically the change in the NTK kernel, so the kernel at iteration n uh, minus the kernel at initialization. This is just a relative error. And you see as the width of the network is increased, the, this NTK kernel does not change under gradient descent iterations. And although the theorem was proven for a one-layer deep neural network, we have empirical results that that, also, that result also holds for uh, arbitrarily deep neural networks. Uh, so again, the NTK uh, operator remains constant during gradient descent. So in, in practice, we can actually verify that numerically that in all cases, the NTK quickly converges to some deterministic kernel and remains constant uh, during training for any architecture and any PDE operator. Okay. Okay. So there's a question there is in that one relative error uh, is relatively large. So actually, this is uh, point one. Yeah. It's, well, you you can see that it remains constant. So as I mentioned here in the bullet point. Uh, the kernel changes a little bit initially during gradient descent and then remains constant. So it may not be perfectly the same kernel as in the initialization, but it just at some point it stabilizes that it remains constant throughout the rest of the gradient descent uh, iterations. Um, as you see, for instance, down here. After a few iterations, basically you just reach this flat plateau and the kernel does not change anymore. Uh, for the three hidden layer case, for the one hidden layer case, which is where the theorem holds, you can actually see that the error is zero even from the very beginning. So for the deeper case, there is some trans transient theory, uh, 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 window after which the kernel stabilizes and remains constant. Okay, so now the question is, okay, so that is one property about the NTK. Oh, you know, it converges to some limiting kernel that does not change during gradient descent. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, that means that we could view our physics informed neural network as an equivalent to a kernel regression problem. So we can actually derive um, update rules or prediction rules and, and treat our model as a kernel regressor. Um, however, uh, so as you see here, you know, these are the standard prediction equations for kernel regression. You have the, your kernel evaluated at the test locations and you have the inverse of your kernel at the training locations times the data. However, this is not practical in the context of pins because this K star matrix is not invertible. So from our experience, the NTK of pins is always degenerate, and therefore we may not be able to casually perform kernel regression predictions in practice. And you see here, this is the spectrum, the eigenvalue distribution of our NTK kernel for a simple example. You see um, the blue line is the spectrum of the kernel at initialization, and the dashed line is after 10,000 iterations of gradient descent. You see the spectrum does not really change. However, uh, the kernel is degenerate, and you cannot really invert it in order to, to treat your method as a kernel method. Uh, so for that, additional regularization uh, is necessary to be able to invert this K matrix. Okay, so, but 
I think for me, what is most, more interesting is what comes into the next slide, where we actually, through the lens of the, the NTK, we can show that these physics and from neural network models suffer from what is called spectral bias. Uh, and spectral bias is also known to be a pathology of standard neural networks and refers to the preferential, um, uh, the preference of neural networks to, uh, to approximating low frequency functions. So by default, neural networks that are trained by gradient descent uh, have this tendency of approximating low frequency functions and have a really, really hard time converging to approximate high frequency components. And you can actually verify that through the lens of this NTK theory, uh, for the case of PIMS, for instance, again, going back to this 1D Poisson equation, you can write down the evolution uh, of your model in terms of, of its NTK. Uh, you can uh, compute the eigen decomposition of the NTK, and essentially what you can show uh, is the following points. First of all, the eigenvalues of the NTK will characterize how fast the absolute training error will decrease. Uh, so essentially, if you have large NTK eigenvalues, that means that your model can train fast and converge, you know, decrease the absolute training error fast. Uh, what is more important is that the components of your target function that correspond to NTK eigenvectors with large eigenvalues will be learned faster. So let's just pause for a second and think about it. So you have a neural network you're trying to train it on a set of data or, or a PDE. And you know you can compute its NTK at initialization, and you know the NTK does not really change much during training. So right from the get-go, you can compute the uh, spectral properties of your NTK, namely its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and immediately that will tell you the preferential directions of your neural network. So you will see from the shape of the eigenvectors, you will see what kind of functions your neural network prefers to, to approximate faster. And it turns out that if those eigenvectors are low frequency and your target function is high frequency, you will have a really, really high time, uh, hard time approximating the function. So indeed, it turns out that for fully connected networks, the eigenvectors that correspond to high eigenvalues of the NTK matrix generally exhibit low frequencies, and that is related to the spectral bias problem. So our network has this built-in preference of approximating low frequency functions. So in practice, if we try to throw a, um, use it in a problem where the function, the underlying function has high frequencies or multi-scale behavior, uh, it will be almost impossible to accurately ap approximate it unless we train with a small, really small learning rate, you know, for a couple of weeks, which is not practical. Um, and the last point here is that in practice, we observe that the eigenvalues of the NTK for physics and formula networks typically decay very, very fast. So that means extremely slow convergence to high frequency components of the target function. So essentially there is this pathology that we cannot really use, uh, you know, based on this theory, we, we shouldn't be using uh, pins for approximating high frequency functions, at least using, you know, vanilla multi-layer perceptance models. Maybe with a better architecture, we could do better. Um, okay, so... Again, what I really like about this theory is just it gives you this tool that from the get-go, from initialization, you can actually get a sense of whether uh, you'll get a reasonable result or not. Uh, and this is what's not very surprising because neural networks are known to suffer from spectral bias. What it was surprising in the context of uh, physics and from neural networks is the second result that indicates a discrepancy of convergence rates in the loss functions, in these composite loss functions that we use. So first of all, we can introduce this metric, which we call the average convergence rate, this quantity C, which is basically just the sum of the eigenvalues of your NTK, um, uh, basically the average uh, of your eigenvalues, which can be easily computed. Uh, and we can see now, we can compute this C quantity for the corresponding blocks in our NTK matrix. Remember, we had this capital K matrix that was comprised of blocks KUU, KUR, and KRR. And now we can compute the C quantity for the individual blocks. And what we see here is a, a remarkable discrepancy in the spectrum of KUU and KRR. So for instance, you see here the eigenvalues of KUU have magnitude of 10 to the power of three. The eigenvalues of KRR have magnitude of 10 to the power of five. According to this definition here, our network will have a much higher preference of minimizing the residual for our problem 
and we have a much slower convergence rate for the boundary. So in this case, we can use this C metric uh, that I just introduced to kind of detect, even from initialization, which of the terms in the loss function will dominate uh, in the optimization. So in this particular case, you can see that the residual dominates over the boundary term. Uh, and as a consequence, the PBE residual will converge much faster during gradient descent than fitting the boundary conditions. And that leads to the failure that I just showed you, that the network cannot really fit the boundary conditions properly, and you get an inaccurate uh, solution. Okay, I see some activity in the chat. I wonder why convolutional networks do better for some problems. So in this context, convolutional networks um, would work like finite differences. So we will have to discretize our domain, uh, treat it as an image in 2D or you know, a, a regular grid. Um, in this case, we sort of eliminate one of the two terms in our formulation because we only need to minimize the residual. Uh, we are not approximating special derivatives with automatic differentiation, and there is a tendency of convolutional networks to perform better. However, you introduce discretization error because essentially convolution corresponds to a finite difference tensor. So there are some issues related to that. Uh, but we can discuss more on that uh, a little bit later. So now based on this result, this sort of motivates that there's interacting terms in our loss function, and then one term is dominating over the other. So perhaps we can try to account for that during training. So um, in the next slide, based on these findings, we propose this adaptive uh, learning rate uh, strategy for balancing the interplay between the different terms. And we do that by trying to balance the spectrum of the NTK for the residual term versus the spectrum of the NTK for the boundary term. So we can choose those constants at initialization, and we can even update them, you know, every couple of steps of our gradient descent algorithm. And effectively, those constants, lambda b and lambda r, you could think of them as changing adaptively their learning rate that we're using for fitting the different terms. Uh, so we just introduce those weights in our loss function, essentially, which are chosen adaptively, and they're not uh, tuned by the user. Um, and doing that actually can lead to significant uh, performance improvements. So here's just an example, um, uh, a, a, an example that tends to be kind of tricky for these physics and form neural networks, and that's a wave equation. So again, it's a, a relatively simple PDE that uh, physics and form neural networks struggle with. In this case, we have three terms in the loss function. We need to penalize the initial condition. We need to penalize the gradient, uh, the time derivative uh, of the initial condition and also the residual of the PD. Uh, if you were to train a physics and form neural network to solve this problem, you will get a prediction that looks like this, which is very, very, um, it smooths out everything and it's very inaccurate. And you can actually do your post-processing and you investigate the reason behind failure for this example. And again, you see this remarkable discrepancy in the magnitude of the spectra for the boundary term, the time derivative term, and the residual. Again, in this case, your model has a really hard time fitting the initial condition uh, for the function, uh, and, and it will fail. The predictions will be uh, not good at all. Um, and then in the next slide, you can actually apply this adaptive algorithm that I just showed you for like adaptively uh, annealing uh, the learning rate. Uh, those constants here, in this case, are set to one, but in the next slide, we're updating them using this update rule uh, by computing the spectrum of the NDK. And you see that those constants, lambda u, vt, and r, quickly converge after a few gradient descent iterations to some plateau. And essentially, all that they're trying to do is to balance the spectrum. So you see here the spectrum of the three different NTK components uh, before the reweighting with solid lines, and then after the introduction of these multipliers, lambda, you see that when we introduce the lambdas, all those lines, the dashed lines, now are, have the same magnitude and that means that during gradient descent, our network learns at the same rate and learns how to minimize the three different terms at the same rate. So no term is dominating over the other. Uh, and that's the only trick that comes into. So this is exactly the same model architecture. Everything is the same, except for the fact that we're using this adaptive weight. Now, for those of you that are uh, experts in numerical methods, you may kind of recognize this as being some sort of um, explicit discretization of your gradient flow, but with some sort of adaptive integrator, so some sort of adaptive step size. 
And you may also wonder what, if we have the stiffness and stability issues, why don't we use an implicit method for discretizing the gradient flow? And the answer is we can, and that's some, you know, we're actually working on it as we speak, and we have some uh, early pr uh, uh, promising results. Uh, and that lends itself to a whole literature in optimization for, um, uh, that, that is related to proximal gradient methods. Uh, so here's another question. Gradient descent is fairly simple. What if you use more sophisticated minimizer like LBFGS? So LBFGS is a quasi-Newton method, so it, it, it utilizes um, approximations to the Hessian. It turns out that for, for neural nets, it does not um, perform really, really well. So in my experience, BFGS performs well in the really small data regime, but overall is less robust than plain stochastic gradient descent. Um, another comment here is that with LBFGS, we cannot really take uh, mini batches, so we cannot uh, perform stochastic updates. So um, for a larger problem in 2D or 3D, where you may have a lot of uh, data points that you need to fit, it, it quickly becomes um, very costly uh, to apply. But yeah, LBFGS is also an alternative for smaller problems. It tends to perform uh, well uh, in many cases. And in many cases, it can, because, of it cons because of constructing an approximation to the Hessian, it can, uh, to some extent, regularize the discrepancies we see between the um, convergence rates in the, in the different loss terms. So I'm running a little bit out of time, so let me just conclude here. This is just a summary of contributions for what I, I, want, I like to call the practical theory for understanding the training dynamics of constrained neural networks, because this is not limited to, to physics-informed neural networks, essentially any sort of multitask learning problem where you have multiple loss functions being minimized at the same time uh, it would exhibit similar behaviors. So I, I put the summary there in terms of future directions. Uh, it's really interesting to analyze, to perform similar analysis for inverse problems like this aneurysm application I showed you earlier. Um, so these physics and formula networks tend to perform a lot better in the inverse problem setting than the forward problem setting. And in fact, we can actually justify why this is the case through the lens of this NTK analysis. And more importantly is how we can use these theoretical findings to engineer better architectures that can be more um, robust with respect to spectral bias and these training converges pathologies. So the message is that in general we should think about developing uh, more specialized architectures and more specialized optimization algorithms for this type of problems and we cannot really resort to you know just employing Adam or some plain neural net architecture and then hope for the best. So it really pays uh, dividends to to think a little bit deeper about it and, and, and and uh, design appropriate methods uh, in, in the setting. So all the failure cases that I showed you, personally, I don't think that they reflect a limitation of the framework. It's more of a limitation of our current understanding of how to properly set up the problem and properly train these deep learning models. Uh, I see another question. What about plugging everything into something like, um, you know, a more sophisticated time integration routine? Um, yes, absolutely. So that's on one hand what I mean by adaptive integration, and you can use implicit methods. Um, and, and people in the optimization literature have taken that route, and there's this whole family of proximal gradient and operator splitting methods. Uh, so here we just we have barely scratched the surface on it, and I think that's a, definitely a direction that is worth looking into. Um, obviously. It introduces some computational bottlenecks and maybe your training might be a little bit slower, but you can gain a lot in terms of stability and, and accuracy. Um, so that's all what I have. I had a final slide just to show you some preliminary results for the inverse problem, where you see here for the comparing the spectra for the forward and the inverse problem, you see that the inverse problem is much better conditioned. So all the spectra are much closer and there is no huge discrepancy between them. And uh, that sort of indicates that the data distribution plays a profound role in this problem. So for the forward problem, we only had observational data for the boundary in initial conditions. So the data distribution was kind of degenerate. However, for the inverse problem, we have data available inside the domain and that regularizes the problem a lot uh, and affects the trainability of our model. So again, we don't have a complete analysis for inverse problems, but this is just a preliminary uh, snapshot to show that uh, through the lens of this NTK analysis, they're much better conditioned than the forward problems. Um, so thank you again a lot for your time, and I, I hope we have a few minutes for discussion.